Greetings, everyone. My name is Mark Nutter. I'm the Conservation Programs Director here at New Hampshire Audubon. First, I'd like to acknowledge that this um, presentation is streaming to you near our state headquarters in Concord, New Hampshire, which is located within the site of the ancient village of Kennecook in Nadakina, which is the traditional ancestral homeland and waterways of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples past and present. I would like to honor and acknowledge with gratitude the land and waterways and our ancestors, the Alnumbach, or human beings, who have stewarded Nadakina throughout the generations for thousands of years. New Hampshire Audubon is honored to continue the stewardship of these lands, providing opportunities for all people to form connections to the natural world. And I invite you to learn more about the indigenous presence on the land you occupy by visiting the website native-land.ca. Here you can explore and click on territories of indigenous people and get connected to resources to learn more about their culture. And for a more in-depth understanding of the Granite State, check out all the educational resources at indigenousnh.com, including this uh, interactive story map that details indigenous presence and their stories here in New Hampshire. And thank you again for your interest in tonight's topic, native pollinator biodiversity, the contributions of native pollinator meadows as presented by Alina Harris, a farm coach with the Xerxes Society. I'm looking forward to exploring this topic alongside you all this evening. And as you may know, this talk is the 15th session of a year-long webinar series called Exploring Connections to and Stewardship of the Natural World, supported by a New Hampshire Humanities Council grant. The past uh, recordings of these excellent talks can be found on uh, New Hampshire Audubon's YouTube page, which are also linked on the series webpage you use to register for this program. Throughout this series, we are exploring the intersection of the sciences and the, hum and the humanities, finding and forging new ways to connect with nature and learn about the importance of conservation action. So I want to invite you to really take the time and space to consider how tonight's topic informs, strengthens, or otherwise supports how you define yourself as a person and how you connect with human communities as well as the wild ones. I implore you to reflect on why this topic is important to you and your personal value system and how you can connect with others through this topic in your daily life. And before I hand it over to Diane to introduce tonight's presenter, I'd like to take this opportunity to do briefly describe how this webinar fits into the larger mission of New Hampshire Audubon. So for those of you who don't know, New Hampshire Audubon is a state-based environmental nonprofit organization that's completely independent from National Audubon. We rely on members and donors like you to support our charitable mission, which has four programmatic pillars. We connect people to nature through environmental education experiences like school programs, nature day camp, and webinars like these. We research and conserve species in peril, including large raptors and small birds. We manage about 10,000 acres of wildlife sanctuaries throughout the state for habitat and recreation. And finally, we advocate for sound environmental policy in the New Hampshire State Legislature. And I am able to be here today because of donors and members like you. We also rely on a huge network of volunteers that assist us with wildlife monitoring, ambassador animal care, environmental education, and wildlife sanctuary management throughout the state. If you're a volunteer member or supporter of New Hampshire Audubon, I would like to sincerely thank you. We simply couldn't achieve our charitable mission without you. And if you'd like to become a part of our conservation family today, which I hope you will, please check out our website, Ways to Get Involved. So tonight we have about 58 uh, people registered for this evening's talk. And you'll see that we're in full webinar mode um, so please feel free to use the chat for any thoughts, comments, or reactions you might have, and reserve the Q&A button for any questions that you'd like answered by Helena. It's been great to see the vast geographies we've been able to reach through these webinars. So for fun, try typing into the chat where are you watching this presentation from. And so, other, so that others may engage with you, simply change where you're sending your chat to everyone. Um, 
I also want to take, uh, give a quick shout out to Diane DeLuca, who's the senior biologist responsible for orchestrating this massive series. Without her leadership and coordination, this webinar series, which has been the largest webinar series I've ever been a part of, would not happen. So thank you, Diane. And speaking of Di Diane, she and I will be monitoring both the Q&A here in Zoom, as well as on Facebook Live, and we'll take questions um, after the presentation, um, mostly, but if you have a, a really burning question, we might um, pause for a moment um, in the middle. And I've also set the parameters of the Q&A so the other attendees can see the questions that are being answered and ask being, and can comment or upvote those questions they want to see answered. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Diane to introduce this evening's presenter. Diane? Thanks, Mark. Um, we're very excited tonight to have Alina Harris with us. So Alina is an integrated pest and pollinator management specialist with CIRCES and a natural resource conservation partner biologist as well. As part of the CIRCES team, Alina works collaboratively with the Natural Resource Conservation Service and with the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension Group. She serves as a liaison between farmers and these organizations by providing technical and financial assistance in integrated pest and pollinator management. Alina is a New Hampshire native with a bachelor's in sustainable agriculture and food production systems, diversified farm management, and a master's in agricultural sciences in sectory plants that promote biological control of pests. Um, both from UNH. She brings over a decade of agricultural experience, including co-managing a diversified farm in New Hampshire, teaching as a farm coach, and serving as the sustainable agricultural specialist at the University of Hawaii. She loves traveling and outdoor activities. Tonight, Alina will share a presentation on native pollinator biodiversity and the contributions that native pollinator meadows make to wildlife diversity and abundance in your community. Welcome, Alina, and thanks so much for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thanks for joining me today to learn about pollinators and how we can support these amazing animals through conservation. Big thanks to New Hampshire Audubon and Diane DeLuca and Mark Nutter for organizing and hosting this webinar tonight. The work of your impassioned organization helps protect and enhance our beautiful biodiversity in New Hampshire and brings together our communities in a meaningful way. Thank you for the important work that you do. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alina Harris and to reiterate some of the bio, I'm the Integrated Pest and Pollinator Management Specialist with the Xerces Society and I'm also an NRCS Partner Biologist. The NRCS stands for Natural Resource Conservation Service, and through this partnership with the NRCS, I provide technical assistance on various pollinator habitat and pest management techniques that are implemented by private landowners and farmers. And with the help of my NRCS colleagues, if a landowner has applied for and been selected for funding, they can actually receive funding to support their conservation efforts. So for example, if a landowner applies and the conservation practices have ranked highly enough for them to be selected for funding, private landowners can receive payment towards the establishment of a pollinator meadow similar to this one in this photo. This first slide shows an established pollinator meadow that's approximately four years old on an orchard in New Hampshire. The meadow provides an aspect of agritourism since it's at the entrance of the orchard as customers drive in and it also provides valuable habitat for native pollinators and beneficial insects that can attack crop pests within the orchard. In the photo it shows one of our goals which is that a minimum of three species are blooming during a given period in the season. So we can see that there's this darker magenta purple ironweed in the center of the photo some lighter pink monarda in the front here. And then in the background, there's some jopiwi. So there I am in the corner at the UNH research farm, proudly holding some of my Brussels sprouts that were grown nearby flowering plants to promote beneficial insects and food pollinators. 
To share a little bit about, about my background and how it connects locally, here's a photo of me in my natural habitat when I was in the process of completing my master's in agricultural science at the University of New Hampshire in Durham. I did three years of field research on a pest of Brussels sprouts. And part of that research was planting annual insect tree plants that attract beneficial insects that attack crop pests. There's a lot of overlap in the world of pest management and pollinator conservation. So keep in mind that most of the habitats that promote pollinator conservation will also support beneficial insects on the whole. In this photo, these are annual plants with seed that was widely available and affordable to farmers. So there's a number of annual and introduced plants that support pollinators and beneficial insects. But today I'm going to fo focus mainly on those native herbaceous plants that might comprise a pollinator meadow or a pollinator garden. And a lot of them are going to be perennial. I also wanted to take a quick moment to share a little background about the Xerces Society. If you haven't heard of Xerces, the nonprofit has been around since 1971, and we work to protect wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. Most people are curious about where the Xerces name comes from and what it means. Our namesake is the Xerces blue butterfly, pictured here, which is thought to be the first American butterfly, unfortunately, to go extinct due to human urbanization and loss of habitat. The Xerces blue butterfly lived in the coastal sand dunes around San Francisco. It's species like this that inspire us to do the important conservation work that we do today with the aim of preventing more beloved invertebrates from going extinct. For example, could you even imagine a world without the iconic monarch butterfly? The Xerces Society does a variety of on the ground conservation work. We have conservation programs for pollinators, agricultural biodiversity, endangered species, pesticides, and a new community engagement program, which is focused on urban communities. Our main office is in Portland, Oregon, but we have staff all across the country working on pollinator habitat restoration, conservation planning, and providing technical assistance and agriculture in both natural and urban areas. This this map shows the locations of our technical support or supervisory staff of Blue Stars, and red indicates Cersei's staff that is also a partner biologist within the NRCS, such as myself. I'm based out of the NRCS state office in Dover, New Hampshire. Cersei's has a plethora of free resources on plants, pollinators, other insects, and habitat restoration. I invite you to visit Xerces.org to access them and share with your friends and colleagues. Before we really get into it, I wanna start up front with acknowledgements. And again, thank the New Hampshire Audubon for hosting this webinar with special thanks to Diane DeLuca and Mark Nutter. And then as a nonprofit, similar to the Audubon Society, the Xerces Society relies on donations from our widespread communities. Special thanks to the NRCS, and the Xerces Society members and our other supporters that allow us to continue the on the ground conservation work and educational presentations just like this one. So if you would like, you can support us too. To give you an overview of today, we will cover the diversity and importance of native pollinators and how there are ripple effects of how invertebrates support other wildlife. We will discuss some of the threats to pollinators and how we can address them. And then when designing a pollinator habitat, we need to first frame it with the habitat needs of pollinators and invertebrates, which broadly consist of food, shelter, and protection from pesticides. Next, we'll briefly talk about generalist and specialist pollinators and how some of the same plants can support both groups. Part of supporting multiple types of pollinators is by providing season-long bloom throughout different flowering species. Next, we'll talk about ways that you could consider enhancing pollinator habitat in your communities or land that you steward. One option, similar to what has been implemented in this photo, is to start from scratch with excellent site preparation where we generally spend an entire year, if not two, killing off the existing vegetation and then establish a brand new, diverse, multi-species mix of mostly perennial and native plants. Or 
with that excellent site preparation and starting from scratch, you might choose to transplant live plants for a quicker jump on the bloom time of these perennial plants that can take a few years to establish before blooming. Alternatively, there's more of a casual, less labor intensive, and many times more affordable method, which is to change the mowing regime of an area that is regularly mowed. With delaying the mowing until after frost, we can promote native and naturalized flowers, flowering species to increase over time. The species may not be as diverse, but it can be a great way to conserve pollinator habitat, especially depending on the goals of the person who's managing it. All right, let's dig into it. Pollinators. There are a lot of different animals that visit flowers, usually for sugary nectar, and end up pollinating those plants. They could be butterflies, they could be moths, anywhere from beetles to flies, and even hummingbirds. These are our most important pollinators. Part of why they're our chief pollinators is because they have more branched hairs and they specifically collect and move pollen from flower to flower, as opposed to some insects that are mostly there for nectar and have smoother, shinier bodies that don't carry as much pollen from flower to flower. Our bees feed that pollen to their young and they specifically compared it, uh, collect it compared to some of our other invertebrates. We have an amazing diversity of native bees in the US with nearly 3,600 species. They range in size from big carpenter bees that get into your sheds to tiny bees about the size of a freckle. Many of them don't look like what you might picture when you think of a bee, such as that metallic green sweat bee in the bottom right center. Most of the roughly 3,600 species of native bees in the United States are quite different from the honeybees. The vast majority, about two thirds, live below ground with only tiny holes that give any sign that they're there, like that center photo. The other third lives above ground in tunnels, in old snags, and in pithy plant stems. That's a small carpenter bee in a blueberry cane nest on the right. And then with that photo on the left, about 1%, the bumblebee species, form small colonies and hollow cavities, which could be above or below ground, but are commonly in old rodent holes. In popular culture, people tend to focus on the introduced European honeybee, whereas much of our focus as conservationists is on these native and wild bees that are not managed by humans. The European honeybee was introduced to North America and is managed actively by humans. If you think about it, they're technically livestock, similar to how ranchers manage and care for their cattle, whereas native and wild bees are unmanaged. As conservationists, our goal is to provide them with adequate habitat and pesticide protection, and they're more or less going to manage the rest. The nice part about native bees is they're quite resilient to the weather in comparison to the European honeybee. Particularly early in the season for crops such as blueberry and apple, Native bees are the ones that are instrumental in the pollination process. Honeybees may choose to stay in their hive when weather is less than 65 degrees Fahrenheit or if it's raining. And when we think about New Hampshire and when an orchard crop is in bloom, it's during the cold month of May. Our native bees are more tolerant of colder temperatures starting in the 50s and can be seen flying in light rain to forage from those flowers. We know that apples have been, that have been pollinated by native bees, or ones that have the synergistic effect of being pollinated by honeybees and native bees, will have larger, higher quality fruit. For some crops, the benefit isn't necessarily in the increase in the number of fruit, but rather in the size of the fruit. An apple or strawberry with nice cross-pollination will be fuller, larger, and less misshapen than a fruit that has received some pollination, but poor pollination. If you're interested in spreading the word about native pollinators and wanna share it with your friends and family, I recommend that you check out this five minute video that my Xerces teammate, Emily May created. It's on our Xerces YouTube channel and it's called Bring Back the Pollinators. I also contributed a lot of video content from New Hampshire. So many of the plants are pretty relevant to the Northeast. Pollinators are incredibly important for our natural systems. 
They allow wildflowering plants to reproduce and continue reseeding in their environments. And then the seeds and fruits of those flowering plants are also food sources for many other types of wildlife, from birds to mammals. Through the simple act of moving pollen from flower to flower, providing cross-pollination, pollinators help build out the base of the food chain for many species. They're also part of that base themselves. About nine in 10 bird species eat insects at some point in their life. Caterpillars or larval butterflies and moths are an incredibly important food source for many birds, especially when feeding their young. Some birds will also occasionally eat bees, either in their larval stage or in their adult form. And insects are in a tremendous source of protein. Pound for pound, insects contain more than twice as much protein as bees. Even bears eat insects, and other animals like turtles, lizards, and fish use insects for food. Again, as you can see here, some pollinators in their larval stage are prey for other species. Without those healthy populations of invertebrates, you know, many of these insects or many of these creatures lose a key source of food. For example, the Carolina chickadee seen here must gather 10,000 caterpillars in a period of about three weeks to successfully raise their chicks. And remember that these caterpillars will transform into pollinator butterflies and moths. So if you're ever having a hard time with getting someone to care about the little tiny invertebrates, maybe take a different approach with inspiring them through some of their more favorite animals, maybe like birds. Remind people that invertebrates and pollinators are truly the foundation of the ecosystems that we love so dearly. There's also an amazing diversity of natural enemies that attack crop pests. You will see that I wrote AKA, also known as beneficial insects. The reason for that is that not all invertebrates that attack crop pests are technically insects. For example, the spider that's on the bluebell flower is technically an arachnid. By saying natural enemy, we can correctly include all the invertebrates that are associated with pest control. Many of these natural enemies are flower visitors and supplement parts of their diet with nectar or pollen. These are the types of invertebrates that you would love to see all throughout your home garden. Again, you can see the wide array of invertebrates that are associated with suppressing pests. It's unfathomable how large and diverse the world of invertebrates really is. With this diversity of natural enemies comes differences in which pests they regulate. If you're specifically interested in beneficial invertebrates, the place to start is this fabulous resource called Habitat Planning for Beneficial Insects to determine which natural enemies you're aiming to conserve and which habitats they prefer. When assessing a site for pollinator conservation, we can frame it with considering the threats to pollinators. We can ask, is there habitat? Is there pesticide risk? Are there managed pollinators that could be spreading disease to native populations? Climate change plays into the plant species selected. These plants can be resilient based on fluctuating conditions such as heavy rain followed by drought. The first two, habitat loss and pesticide protection, are going to be the main focus of this presentation. The good news is there are steps we can all take to address these threats. In response to habitat loss, we can create or manage for habitat. In response to pesticide exposure, we can check in with our family about how we manage the grass and garden, or we can ask nursery suppliers about their growing practices. For disease and competition of managed pollinators, we can educate people to reduce those risks and be thoughtful about how they're used in their agricultural system. For climate change, we can plan for species and habitat diversity that will be resilient with fluctuating weather conditions. To conserve our native and wild pollinators and invertebrates, what are their habitat needs? They're really similar to our needs. So if you are, feel so inclined, try and throw some of those into the chat. What do those pollinators need, need for us to conserve them just as a baseline? I'm just gonna move forth 
and just give me the answer here, which is food, shelter, and protection. What do pollinators need for food? That one I'm sure most people are pretty aware of. You're probably thinking nectar and pollen, but monarchs are pollinators. What do they need in their caterpillar stage to survive? They need a milkweed host plant in order to transform from a caterpillar to a chrysalis. So then the monarch adults still need nectar to fuel them on their great migration. To promote a wide diversity of pollinators and vertebrates, we recommend multi-species season-long bloom to provide nectar and pollen. And as we just talked about, some require a host plant for their larval stage. When thinking about food for pollinators, we want a diverse mix of flowering plants that has multiple species blooming in the beginning, middle, and end of the season. On this slide, there's a mix of naturalized and native species that are both perennial and annual. This is a very simplified diagram to show that we aim to have at least, or what we're aiming for, three early blooming, three mid blooming, and three late blooming species included in the mix. Many times, mixes will include more than 25 species. Contrary to popular belief, including more species in your mix doesn't necessarily increase the cost of the mix, depending on the company that you're purchasing it from. In some cases, it actually moderates the cost. You'll note that on the bottom of this slide, that chart was adopted from UNH Cooperative Extension publication on wildflowers in Southern New Hampshire. UNH Professor Emeritus Kathy Neal has done some fabulous research on pollinator meadows and recently Emma Erler from UNH Cooperative Extension has done some nice webinars on pollinator habitat. You may have even seen her presentation in this webinar series. She focused on flowering trees and shrubs for pollinator conservation, which would be a really nice complement to this presentation that's focused mostly on herbaceous pollinator plants found in meadows. We will also be sharing with you some great links to pollinator trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants within the chat and in a follow-up email. So keep your eyes out for those resources. And there are some generalist species, <clears throat> such as bumblebees, that you can see all throughout the season, foraging from a wide range of flowers, whereas there are some specialist bees that may only come out during a short period of time during the season, maybe even only a couple of weeks, and they require pollen from a specific genus to feed their young. If they don't have this specific tool available, then that bee is completely out of luck. The cool part is that these two fall blooming plants feed a number of generalist pollinators like those bumblebees, but also in the study conducted by Jared Fowler, he found that goldenrods pictured on the left are invaluable food to 11 species of specialist bees. And the asters pictured on the right are necessary for six specialist bees in the Northeast to complete their life cycle. So depending on where you are, if you're in New Hampshire, you may be seeing these species currently in bloom. All right, coming back to the habitat needs for pollinators and invertebrates. Next is shelter. I'm actually gonna wait for some answers out of this one. Type into the chat what you know. What are some of the things that pollinators need for shelter? Where do they live? Where do they overwinter? While you're giving some of that some thought and typing it into the chat, which I've kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, I'll discuss the contrast of shelter for honeybees versus our native and wild bees. So for honeybees, which are those introduced species and are managed by humans, that's pretty straightforward. And the components look something like this. Whereas I'll wait to see, Mark, is there anything coming in on the chat with some good oh, ideas? Yeah, we, we've got so many uh, smart people out there. Hollow stems, canes, brush piles, leaf litter, hollow stems, rodent burrows, sandy soil, wow. stems, bare soil, leaf litter. Wow, crushing it, audience. I'm so yeah, proud of you. Dirt, dying plants. Yeah. 
that's all. Nice. Well, I'm really <laughs> proud of everyone for knowing their pollinator conservation. Um, so we will move forth. Um, like I said, most of the species of native bees in the United States are quite different from the honeybees. You've seen this slide before, but what I added to it is our corny phrase, which is, don't be a flower weather friend, because most people recognize that pollinators need flowers for food, but it's key to underscore the need for that undisturbed habitat to conserve these animals through their entire life cycle by leaving their nesting and overwintering habitat undisturbed. So as you all began to say, for native bees, shelter can be dead fallen logs or standing dead trees, which we refer to as snags. Other nesting habitats include sandy undisturbed soils, native bunch grasses and plants with hollow or pithy stems, such as elderberry, raspberry, sumac, or joe pie weed. Here in New England, we have a lot of rock walls, which are great undisturbed habitat because we legally can't disturb them. And then other habitats might be rock piles on the edge of crop fields. So here are those actual photos of brush piles, bunch grasses, and hollow or pithy stems that have been left as nesting and overwintering habitat. They may not look as sexy as bright flowers, but these are critical habitats for our native and wild bees. So when we think about annually tilled vegetable fields and cover crops, though they do provide that temporary food, unfortunately, these practices disturb nesting and overwintering habitat. The ideal gold standard pollinator and beneficial habitat would be perennial, permanently undisturbed habitat, such as these pollinator meadows, which could also include some annuals. Another undisturbed habitat would be tree or shrub plantings, which could be done in a hedgerow style, but like I said, it's not the focus of this presentation. For any of these types of habitats, ideally, it would consist of mostly locally adaptive native plants, which have co-evolved alongside our native pollinators and therefore can best support one another. But establishing pollinator meadows isn't as easy as you may think. It isn't exactly rocket science, but it is a long-term commitment that requires a lot of steps and attention to detail. Depending on the site, it can be one to two years of site preparation, and only in year three after seeding will it begin to look like these beautiful photos. Since these native seeds are perennial, they take a few years to establish their roots. Some may not flower for a couple of years while they're establishing, and it's important to know what to expect because during site preparation, it can become an eyesore, and even once established, maybe too wild looking for some people's aesthetic. For pollinator meadows, we recommend that native grass is part of the mixture, which can be a surprise to some people. Does anyone know why we include native grasses in pollinator meadows? Feel free to type your thoughts into the chat. Is the answer host plants for skippers? That's one reason. Um, and it, and it did you did just mention that sh shelter is important and um, provided by grasses, the root systems. I'm just taking everyone's answer from the the uh, chat here. Perfect. So of course, as we mentioned, bees like nesting in those native bunch grasses. But furthermore, one of the reasons the grasses are included is they add structure to the meadow, which physically holds the flowers up from flopping over, as well as helping reduce competition from weeds in the beginning by filling in gaps, and it can also reduce erosion. I tend to add a little, I tend to add a little bit of <laughs> little blue stem and wild rye into the mixes. Um, and these native grasses are nowhere near as aggressive as our introduced species of grasses that we will see covering our landscapes. That's why it's so important to fully kill the non-native sod before seeding native meadows, which leads us to our next slide. The first and most critical step is site preparation. Most projects fail because of inadequate site prep and weed control prior to planting. There are pros and cons to every site prep method. Organic site prep methods take longer and it can be harder 
can be more expensive, particularly when converting larger sites. I'll highlight the three main method options that I recommend in New England, which are black tarp, herbicide, and stale seed bedding with a smother crop with buckwheat. I'll quickly reference solarization and sheet mulching, which I'll put less emphasis on. All site preparation methods have their pros and cons and will be site specific for a myriad of reasons, such as the funding available, the existing vegetation on the site, if equipment is available and what kind, and the landscape of the selected site. Most of the time in New Hampshire, we're faced with very weedy sites. This field on the left is what I would consider very weedy. It's going to take aggressive site preparation to kill the sod. Here, depending on the landowner, I would recommend using silage tarp or an herbicide treatment. Either way, the first step is going to be to mow the site as close to the ground as possible and remove the vegetation. So starting with tarping to terminate the weeds, in the spring, we would recommend to mow that existing vegetation as close to the ground as possible. We want to remove the thatch or existing vegetation, which could be with a York break or build up as one with wood with hay. And then we want to lay the tarp tightly over the site. And then if we have multiple pieces, we wanna overlap that tarp and add many sandbags to weigh them down. Then over the summer, and this is why we have so many sandbags, we wanna check frequently uh, for areas uncovered by wind or damaged by wildlife. And then come autumn, we want to evaluate the soil and plant residue for signs of living roots or plants, because at this point we don't wanna be seeing that. And then if in doubt, replace the tarp for a whole nother season of site preparation. And no one ever wants to hear that, but uh, don't treat the messenger. It's just what you need to do. If you're, if you're feeling like it's not adequate, don't, don't throw down all of that expensive native seed. Um, way better to wait a year. And so it's paramount that after all of this effort, you do not till at this point because it's just going to kick up weed seeds from below the soil surface. Having said that, if you have the equipment and want to start in the spring with inverting the sod rhizomes and then lay down the tarp, that can be a viable method. And in the next couple of slides, I'll talk about how New Hampshire Audubon is comparing these two methods on their own site and they'll be seeding it down this October. So first I wanted to give you the context to show that at the New Hampshire Audubon, they're trying four different site preparation methods within this one photo. On the left, you can see that they have used a type of weed mat or what people may call landscape fabric that's woven. On the right, you can see that they used a thick black plastic. Beyond the two different tarp types, they also started their, with their site prep with tilling one portion prior to laying it down and solely mowed the other portion down to the ground and removed the vegetation residue before laying down the tarp. I'm very excited to see what they are gonna find when they lift up the tarp in a couple of weeks. And I'm sure they're gonna be excited to share with us in future webinars. So big kudos to New Hampshire Audubon and their strong volunteers. Keep up the great work. And so some of these benefits to using TARP is you can reduce herbicide use, or in this case, use no herbicides. This site uh, did not allow any use of pesticides. And so we went this method and it reduces tillage. In this case, they did not till beforehand and it may create habitat for spiders. And then the soil is covered from weed seed that may be blown onto the site. So if we think about it, you can see in the foreground here, there's this non-native grass. And if that were to go to seed, at least that site would be covered during um, the site preparation process. So we could kind of, if you were really careful about it, you can actually collect that seed on the top of the tarp and um, you know, pour it on the side, not within the site that you're trying to keep those seeds out of. Here's an example of opaque silage tarp, which is similar to what we've been seeing, which is white on one side and black on the other and held down with many sandbags. In 2019, 
The site seemed to have really excellent site preparation with the silage tarp as shown in this photo, which is taken in August. It was then seeded the fall of 2019. In Kathy Neal's site preparation research at UNH, she tested the effectiveness of these methods and found that it was equally as reliable as herbicide treatment. And I found that to be really, really uh, hopeful. And so for me, if the site is less than a quarter acre and the landowner is willing to go with silage tarp, it seems to be our most dependable option. However, I will say large pieces of this tarp is not necessarily cheap. And here you may be thinking to yourself, but this doesn't disturb pollinator habitat by creating bare ground and everything. Um, and as we discussed, some bare undisturbed ground is good, but we're kind of disturbing it in some of these circumstances of site preparation. And the answer is that yes, unfortunately, in the short term, we are removing or disturbing habitat whether it be through silage tarp, if we were to you know, do some tillage, or if we did tillage in a buckwheat smother crop, or if we were using the herbicide. Overall, we're kind of just removing habitat temporarily. The key to accepting this temporary shortcoming of the process is to remember that once this habitat is established, it will be high quality habitat for a very long time. And in the end, it's worth this short-term loss for a wonderful long-term gain. Here is the solarization process using clear tarp rather than the opaque silage tarp shown in the previous slides. I'm only showing this as a contrast with the opaque silage tarp. Solarization isn't as dependable in the Northeast as it may be in other parts of the country. And it requires even more steps and attention to detail compared with silage tarp. I would recommend the silage tarp over a clear tarp in the Northeast. In the interest of time, I'll just leave it there. Most people who are interested in installing pollinator meadows will be pretty put off by mentioning herbicides. In these situations, I explain that all site prep methods have their pros and cons. And though site preparation removes habitat in the short term, like we discussed, we're preparing to convert it to many years of permanent or perennial cover. There's also not solid research showing that it actually harms the bees. Um, but jury's still out and we're still searching that literature. Even non-chemical methods like tillage destroy invertebrate habitat and using plastic or silage tarp has that downside that it will likely end up in the landfill. Herbicide can be helpful for larger sites since it's probably the cheapest option. And then one of the benefits of herbicide method is that it can be a no-till method. So using this method, like with other methods, we first want to closely mow the existing vegetation to the ground, then use a non-selective and most importantly, non-persistent herbicide. Treatments will be repeated every time the weeds green up and reach around four to six inches. As with all site prep methods, once you're towards the end of terminating the existing vegetation, you do not want to till or disturb the soil since it will only kick up seeds that are existing just a couple of inches below the soil. Next is a method you would use on previously cropped land or sites with very little weed pressure. I will say though, it's extremely rare for me to come across a site that has low weed pressure. The site is shallowly cultivated and it's direct seeded once the weather has warmed up. It's important to note that it may require irrigation for successful establishment. And I recommend planning to seed it before a rain if you don't have access to that. Since buckwheat is a quick cover crop, if conditions are right in the Northeast, you may be able to squeak in two successions of buckwheat to smother the weeds within one season. Buckwheat winter kills and doesn't have much biomass, but it can be used as a very quick cover crop for parts of the season uh, in other circumstances to cover the ground to feed some of our favorite farm invertebrates. And so really quickly, I'm just gonna go through some of these beneficial insects and pollinators. This first photo is a pretty impressive bee mimic, but it's actually a hoverfly. Some hoverflies have predatory larvae that eat small soft body pests, such as aphids, scale, spider mites, and thrips. The second step of this pyramid boasts a native pink spotted lady beetle 
that is predatory in the larval stage as well as adult stage and prefer aphids and scale, but will feed on alternative prey such as white flies, mites, thrips, and insect eggs. Next is this orange and black, relatively large soldier beetle. These soldier beetles require pollen and nectar to survive, but also eat pest eggs, caterpillars, various insect larvae, aphids, snails, and slugs. The bottom tier of the pyramid shows the array of native pollinators and also that honeybees enjoy foraging from the buckwheat as well. Note that while the monarch caterpillars require milkweed plants for food, that we can support monarch adults by providing them with nectar plants that bloom later into the year when they're present in our region. One other favorite method from home gardeners and homesteaders is sheet mulching. Sheet mulching may be suitable for very small plantings with access to lots of high quality labor and all of these different materials. It's possible to accomplish site preparation using this method, but you really need to make sure you truly include every single layer here and be realistic about the size of the metal and how much you can accomplish. If the land steward cannot commit to every layer on this recommendations diagram, then it's not the right site preparation method for them. And so you can see all the different steps that you would want a half inch of grass clippings, then you would want cardboard or newspaper, an inch of composted manure, then two inches of straw or leaves, and then another two inches of composted manure or composted plant material, and then 1.5 inches of wood chips or sawdust. And so I'm sure there are people that have tried other recipes for this, but this is the one that we would give you if you wanted to have successful, excellent site preparation. Once we have prepared the site, it's time for seeding. Some of these native or naturalized seeds that go into pollinator meadows can have very tiny seed, and some can have quite large seed. You can see the major difference between black-eyed Susans versus partridge pea. Likewise, the great lobelia seed is very tiny, almost the size of a black pepper flake that you might sprinkle onto your food, whereas the size of the cut plant seed is a lot more robust. Next, we're going to talk about seeding, and I just wanted you to be able to picture the different seed sizes. So for broadcast seeding, we want to sow in the fall after a few hard frosts, but before snow cover. So some cases people will seed in the spring, but we really only recommend that if conditions are historically wet in the fall. And next we want to create a smooth seed bed. And again, avoid cultivation. It kicks up the weed seeds. Um, and I'm sorry for saying that so many times, but it's, uh, there's a reason I'm saying it so many times. Next, you want to mix with an inert carrier such as sand or gypsum to bulk up that material. And so it's gonna show you kind of where you're seeding it because if you're seeding these, what you're picturing as that black pepper flakes, they might just kind of disappear into the field and you're not really sure where you've seeded it or not. And you wanna divide it into portions based on the seed size. So you can see my colleague there, she's seeding down the area with her one bucket, but then she also has a number of other buckets that she's divided that seed into. So especially if you're seeding it by hand, you're kind of scattering it like poultry feed, uh, like you would be feeding chickens almost. And um, yeah, you might find that, oh my goodness, I've run out of seed, but I only covered one part of the site. So by putting it into different buck buckets um, and based on different seed size or just to help you distribute it, uh, it's just gonna help you keep track of that tiny, tiny seed and it is expensive. So you want to scatter the seed using at least two different perpendicular passes for even distribution in the field. And then oddly enough, you're going to compact the soil for seed to soil contact. And so many of you might be thinking, what the heck? Most of the time when we talk about conservation, we want to avoid compacting the soil and that is true. But again, just for this temporary one time that we're doing it, Basically, we're just smushing that really tiny seed into 
the um, mineral soil. So it needs mineral soil, uh, basically soil or chipped off little pieces of rock. It needs that mineral soil to smush against in order to germinate. And since they are so tiny, we don't wanna bury them deep into the ground because they wouldn't germinate. So we have them right on top and then we're just pressing them into the soil. And you can see um, there's a soil roller, two different kinds in those right photos of Eric Venturini. And unfortunately, it's quite common for people to think that they have failed in year one after planting, planting or seeding. Um, so put some of your ideas into the chat. Why do you think that is? Why might a person think they've failed? Because again, this is, this is a rough topic. Nobody really likes to fail publicly. And so someone might decide to um, just till under their whole field or double the amount of seeds that they have seeded the year prior. And we would not recommend either of those in year one. Um, so people think they failed, but they haven't failed. And there's actually not even a way to tell if you have failed really within year one until you wait a little bit longer and do that management. So we're getting some responses in the chat here. Alina, uh, no flowers, doesn't look nice. The plants are small, so they seem thinly planted. Perennials are not big enough yet. Just a total lack of flowers. Um, not, yeah, a few people says no flowers. Yeah, um, perfect. We have such a smart audience. So part of that reason is that perennial plants are slow to establish. I think it makes sense that a seed the size of black, the uh, seed the size of a black pepper flake might take some time to grow into a robust flowering plant that's large. In the first one to two years, our perennial native plants put energy into their root system, and they're really focusing on that root system, and they're not focusing on creating blooms. However, annual wheat seeds will be in the seed bank and are fabulous at growing quickly and outcompeting young native seedlings. For example, the top photo on the right shows annual weeds creating excessive shade on Illinois bundle flower. What we can do to address the annual weeds and prevent them from taking over um, during the establishment of the perennial wildflowers is um, we prevent that those seed heads from forming and then we do that within the site and adjacent to the site or surrounding that site. So like when we saw the tarp and we saw that there was those grasses growing around it, we'd really recommend mowing around that uh, site as well. Um, <clears throat> so we could do this by high mowing. Um, and in cases where you might not have the large equipment, you could use a weed whacker. So for high mowing during establishment, you wanna cut off the forming seed heads and the canopy of the vegetation. So kind of like think of a rainforest or how foresters will talk about the canopy. Um, the native plants are establishing in the understory. And so in forestry terms, the native plants are then released to get sunlight and less competition from those weeds. And for the height of mowing, year one after planting, we recommend that whenever the overall vegetation reaches around 12 to 18 inches that we cut it down to about eight inches. After year two of planting, you would repeat something similar, but you would raise that mower to a height of maybe 10 inches. And then every time the wildflower growth has grown taller than eight inches. And these aren't hard and fast numbers. Um, you're just also using your common sense. You wanna be looking at where those annual weed seeds are forming and you wanna remove those, but you're trying not to harm the native flowers that are growing up. And also just remember, if you do have a few kind of early blooming species that are usually cheaper and they might be annuals or biennials, it is going to be worth sacrificing those annuals or biennials and mowing them in that first year because you're really thinking about the long-term 
management of this um, meadow. So here's an example of what one year after planting a uh, site might look like. This is a site that I showed you with the fellow pulling back the silage tarp and we could see that there were zero live plants beneath the tarp to start with. <clears throat> he seeded down a nice custom mix for his somewhat moist field. He continued to high mow very regularly and this is what it looked like in year one after planting because despite having started with that excellent site preparation using black tarp, a challenge this site encountered was there was a resurgence of clover which was not included in the perennial mix. And we had a drought year. So the moisture loving natives that were establishing were pretty stunted. He was very diligent about high mowing annual weeds and the clover that was coming in. In this case, despite clover providing flowers for pollinators, it can be quite aggressive as a non-native introduced species and can outcompete the establishing wildflowers. Only time will tell how well this meadow will turn out. I still have my fingers crossed, but just an example of how you can do almost every single step correctly, but still have challenges with establishment. And so don't get down on yourself. Each site is different. And um, yeah, for this reason though, I would be careful with trying to establish native pollinator meadows on top of sites that have clover seeds in the seed bank. Here's a sweet little timeline of a farm that used repeated shallow tillage on cropland and they used it to prepare their site for a direct seeded meadow. This is on a very low weed pressure site from the beginning and they had the equipment on hand. So they were able to establish this meadow fairly quickly. In April, they shallowly harrowed three times. Then they came back in May and direct seeded. Remember in New Hampshire, unless you have a wet site, if you're direct seeding, we would recommend a fall seeding. But this grower must have done, had a reason for seeding it in the spring. And so you can see that they mowed quite a few times in July, August, and into September. And then the following spring, it's just vegetative growth until mid-June in Hudson Valley, where we begin to have some early blooming species. And then in the center, you can see that more golden looking rutabecchia, the black eyed Susan seedlings in the center. And some species that we seed are actually biennials. And so they can bloom earlier in year one or year two. Um, and so, like I said, these are the ones that we can see that this looks really beautiful from here in these photos. But if we were seeing a lot of aggressive weeds that we knew were in there, it would be worth sacrificing these very inexpensive species that are blooming and mowing those down um, because we're, we're trying to think about the longevity of this perennial meadow. And those species are actually gonna peter out over time because they are biennials anyways, so. But circling back to the foundational habitat needs for invertebrates, we need to protect these flowering habitats from pesticides. So much of what I do is advocate for adding buffers between areas that are pollinator habitat and areas that use pesticides. Um, and in some cases, an option to minimize pesticide drift and exposure to non-target organisms like pollinators is to use vegetative barriers, such as non-flowering hedgerows or windbreaks. But today, I'm just going to focus on the aspect of purchasing bee safe plants. If you were to purchase them for a home garden or insert them into a meadow. To talk about purchasing bee safe plants, I'd like to give you some background on one of the most commonly used pesticides. Neonicotinoids are a particular class of a pesticide. And since it's such a mouthful, for short, people call them neonics. Neonics have many application methods. Many people seem to be familiar with foliar sprays applied on the leaves and above ground tissues of plants, but neonics can also be applied as a soil drench and in treated seed as seed coatings. Some commonly used crops that tend to have neonic treated seed are corn, soybean, sunflower, and canola. And since pollinators visit some of these crops, we need to be really aware of this if we were to be planting, for instance, sunflowers for pollinators, we wouldn't want to poison them in the process. 
reason why we might poison them in the process is that neonics are actually water soluble, which means they can move easily through the soil solutions. Neonics are also systemic pesticides, which means the toxins are uptaken and transported internally through the plant where it can later be expressed in the pollen and nectar in their flowers. Then foraging pollinators and beneficials collect this contaminated pollen and nectar and bring it back to their nests and young, which can decrease reproduction in native bees. If pesticide exposure is high enough, sometimes it can be lethal and kill bees outright, but sometimes the bees do not die outright and it can have more subtle effects on the behavior of bees, which we can refer to as sublethal effects. Neonics are the most commonly used pesticide in the world, so keep an eye out. If we're planting seedlings for pollinators, wouldn't it be a shame if they were toxic? When, plant, when buying plants, we can talk with nurseries about their growing practices. The Xerxes Society Pesticide Program team put together a nice postcard with the following three steps. Seek out organic plants and seeds. Avoid plants grown with neonicotinoids and other systemic insecticides. And then number three, ask what steps your nursery takes to offer plants growing using, offer plants grown using pollinator friendly pest management. You can get more detail from our new fact sheets, buying bee safe plants and offering bee safe plants, a guide for nurseries. And both of these fact sheets are available on our website for downloading. And if you're working with a group and want multiple copies, please feel free to contact us at pesticides at xerxes.org. And from the bottom of our hearts, thanks for keeping our bees happy and healthy by committing to buying bee safe plants. And what I found to be particularly helpful when starting a dialogue with nursery managers is table one in the publication called Offering Be Safe Plants, a guide for nurseries. I briefly gave you an introduction to neonics, but in this table, we have included active ingredients in the neonic class that are particularly toxic to pollinators. Likewise, there are two other classes of pesticides that are less widely known, but are also systemic, and some act active ingredients in these classes pose risk to pollinators as well. Some active ingredients in these classes, the butanoloids and diamides should be avoided as well. Pesticides to avoid is a starting point for talking to nurseries, but the guidance in these publications also provide a wider framework for pollinator friendly pest management for nurseries. And finally, Swinging back around to our last topic, a more casual way of creating habitat. If there's already the beginning of a decent pollinator habitat in a system, particularly over a large area where there's limited funding but access to mowing equipment, one option is to delay mowing an old field, such as the two that are seen in these photos. By delay, I'm talking about not mowing it during the summer months, but waiting to mow after frost or two in the autumn. The photo on the left shows an area that hasn't been mowed at the same farm that was also shown in the title slide. Here's that photo to jog your memory of a meadow that they started from scratch. With aggressive site preparation, which resulted in that showy display at the entrance of their farm and had higher native species diversity. These delayed mode areas may not exhibit the same diversity of native plants. For example, we can see the prevalence of introduced species of Queen Anne's lace and red clover. But at the same time, we see the native monarch is making use of this non-native red clover flower. These delay mode plantings may not be as diverse, but can still provide meaningful pollinator value. And on the right, you can see my gorgeous cousin Nina frolicking through a conservation property in New Hampshire, which has been using management techniques like delayed mow to promote flowering plants that are already in the system. Doesn't it make you just want to twirl around and sing the hills are alive? So if you're involved with land management and want to take a more casual approach of pollinator conservation, you could consider doing a delayed mow and even apply for NRCS funding to achieve it. When I say rotational delayed mow, that means that you could mow approximately one third of the field in the first year, 
You could mow a different third of the field the following year. And then the last unmowed portion would be mowed in the third year. In this way, we can maintain open areas for other wildlife like brown nesting birds by keeping woody trees from encroaching into this habitat, but are able to leave two thirds of the area undisturbed per year, which gives our pollinators that overwintering and nesting habitat that's critical for them to complete their life cycle. Well, I hope you're inspired today. And if so, please visit the resources through the links that Mark has been providing you with or visit online. And for further readings, we also have some wonderful books. And with that, it concludes this presentation. And I'd like to thank you for your interest in invertebrate conservation. And I hope that you can spread the word, not only spread the word, but take action in your communities. And if you aren't a land steward, or if you're not sure where to start, Try reaching out to the New Hampshire Aud Audubon and volunteer with their pollinator habitat creation and in management going forward. And I can certainly take some questions as the time allows. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alina. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, Alina. There's um there's a question about, do you have info on timing delaying the mowing of hay fields to permit grassland nesting birds time to complete their nesting? Yeah, so there is actually a NRCS practice that is designed for the ground nesting birds. Um, I believe that mow date that they require is, I think it's like you have to wait until around October 1st. I would have to double check that but it's a little sooner than we might like for the monarchs uh, because that practice is designed for birds and the birds would have fledged by that point. Um, so we do, we try to kind of do the like be friendly birds thing where if possible, you could delay that mowing um, un until the end of the year. But in the case of if this person is actually paying and that's part of their livelihood and they need to feed their animals. Um, we just need to consider how we can kind of, you know, we want them to be able to feed their animals, but we also want to conserve pollinators. And so there are ways to do that. We have a rapid monarch assessment where you can go out and actually scout for monarchs ahead of time. You can also scout for those birds, I believe. It's not as much my wheelhouse, but if you are in New Hampshire, we have Kelly Boland, who's our state biologist, and she really excels in that area. Um, and we usually kind of tag team those situations. And so I would, I would connect with her. And if you're not in New Hampshire, most likely whatever state you're in will have some sort of practice like that. Um, and again, you could be getting funding for that if you were selected. I've got a question. How did you get into this field of study and what motivates you to protect pollinators? Well, I think it's interesting. I, it's a good question. I mean, I've always, I, I grew up in Durham. I grew up in the woods and really honoring nature and being close with it. Uh, my first word as a child, probably beyond my word mom or like dad, was uh, that was the word flower. And I think that's a reflection of my mother who's deeply inspired by flowers. Um, and so, yeah, then I really fell in love with farming by traveling when I was 18 and volunteering on farms in Sweden. And then that ended up getting me into the world of insects because you really can't <laughs> not notice the insects in that system. Um, so then, yeah, beyond that, I started thinking about how can we use insects to suppress pests rather than pesticides. And that was kind of my beginning intro slide of my master's. And that's what really got me into invertebrate conservation. When you, when you spend three years observing them in the field, um, you either hate it and don't want to revisit it, or you 
totally fall in love with it, which is what happened to me. Nice. Yeah, that's a great story. I'm kind of curious about the very intensive method that you shared where you, you're putting layer upon layer um, on top of a field to get it ready. Is there any research that shows that that kind of method is more effective for areas that have invasives as opposed to just using herbicides that a small landowner who wants to do a small patch, that might be a very effective way of dealing with invasives or are there other methods that you shared? Yeah, that could be a way of dealing with them. I believe you may have seen it. Um, I know you've been in contact with Matt Tarr out of UNH Cooperative Extension, but I know that that was one of his projects that he worked on really hard was finding those alternatives. And I believe he has a webinar or a video or a write-up out on that. And I do think he was kind of using that lasagna method. I'm not sure of the... Um, the details of it, but I would I would certainly search Matt Tar UNH Cooperative Extension, and um, I want to say it was for the control of Japanese knotweed. And um, one method that I found to be very interesting that I I haven't found scientific papers to back it yet, but I also haven't really looked for them is using some sort of a wire mesh on top of um, the Japanese knotweed. So a lot of persistent invasive plants, if you just chop them down, they'll keep coming back. And so we saw that a lot when I was living in Hawaii with the acacia trees. You can't just chop them down, they'll keep coming back. So instead we would girdle them. And that was basically, they were unable to transport their nutrients up and down from their underground storage organs to where they're photosynthesizing. And so in the case of the Japanese knotweed, I did see a blog about how someone, I believe it was in the UK, was using some mesh wire netting and they actually placed that on the soil surface, kind of like you saw with the tarps, but that mesh, it was maybe about the size of what I'm showing you in the video, um, maybe, I don't know, quarter inch or something. And the Japanese knotweed would actually grow up through that mesh and it would flourish until it got girdled by the mesh. And then that, so it would just keep sending up new shoots and those shoots would girdle and die. And then basically the idea is you're trying to exhaust that underground storage organ from all of its energy. And pretty impressive how much energy is in there. Yeah. Yeah, Matt definitely has a video. And I do believe you're correct. There's Japanese knotweed that he was working with. His, um, I think his, his method of layering was just slightly different maybe, but it's, it just seems like a great way to go if someone has a lot of energy and they don't wanna use herbicides and they have a small plot where they, that they wanna to convert to a pollinator meadow. For sure, for sure. It definitely will work. Like I said, just make sure you do all the steps. It's, uh, it's always tempting to stick, you know, skip a couple steps here and there, but this is not a situation where I would do that. Yeah, that was kind of interesting when you said that you should look at it. How would you determine whether or not we should keep it covered for another year? So at that point, um, basically it's just about the residue that's left over. So, I mean, as we saw in those photos that I showed of your site, that was much earlier in the summer. Um, there was still some of that, you know, the area that hadn't been tilled, there was some residue on top. Mm -hmm. The nice part of what I was seeing or what you were seeing in those photos too, was that that residue, you know, there's like, some roots and some um, above ground of that sod that are there, it, you know, what you want to be seeing is dead residue. And as long as that residue is dead, that's good. But if you really have a lot of thick roots underneath there, 
And like we said, we want that seed to soil mm. contact and we, yeah. And so if there's a lot of residue and most of the time there is in the situations that I showed you in those weedy situations um, of the old hay field or a field similar to yours that had a lot of residue, um, we really want to remove that residue. So you could do it at the end of the season. Um, for instance, if you lift up that tarp and you say, oh, the, okay, the residue is dead, but it's still here. And how are my little seeds ever gonna find their way mm. to the soil and then find their way back up to the, or like get a little enough light once they do, um, then you could either hand break it with all of your healthy, vigorous volunteers, <laughs> Or if you were able to hire or rent a York rake, that's mm. an attachment on the back of a tractor that you could use. And we recently worked with an organic farm. We did that and they did what I would actually recommend, which is they pulled it up in August. They had really great, a really great situation, um, but it had a lot of residue. And mm. so, it ended up taking them three to four passes in mid to end of August with that York rake. They removed that residue and then they were able to put that tarp back down to kind of neutralize is what I would call it at that point where it's mostly dead. You may have in that scratching process, you know, you're going as light as possible where you're removing the residue, but you're trying not to scratch and disturb the soil mm -hmm. because it's less about pollinator habitat at that point. It's more about not disturbing the weed seeds up into the surface. Right. Um, so I think in an ideal situation, you lift it up in August, rake any residue and put the tarp back mm. down. What I would imagine in your site situation is the part that's been tilled. Um, even in the photos that I showed, there was really no residue, right? So <laughs> I think you're good to go on that. And I would feel pretty confident with that site preparation. On the area where you didn't till, you might consider raking it. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, I pretty much would say rake yeah, it. Yeah, I think that's what we had planned is to set the volunteer army uh, with rakes on it. Um, so that's good to hear that that's, that's an option. So we could move forward with that project. Yeah, and then it's just, Using your common sense when you're in that process, if you're seeing any sort of green matter mm -hmm. in there, if it looks anywhere near alive, or if you're feeling like in order to re uh, remove that residue, you scratched a lot deeper than you had hoped, mm. that's when you might delay it. Okay. So there's a, oh, go, go ahead, it. Mark. No, go ahead for it. There's another question from the audience. If you have a meadow that was planted mostly with annual wildflower seeds, how would you recommend adding perennial seeds to it in the following year? So I guess I would just ask you, is there other weeds within those annuals? Um, and kind of what annuals? Because some annuals will play nice and some won't. And it kind of just depends on the seeding rate. My, without knowing all of the details of the situation, I would say that if you don't have a lot of weeds and um, they're annuals, go ahead and seed some perennial seeds into it as long as, again, you need to expose the soil um, without disturbing it. Uh, but if in doubt, I would do a whole year of site preparation. No one ever wants to hear that, but it's the truth. I'm sorry. <laughs> so Lena, Donna says there were not many weed seeds, lots of cosmos. Nice, yeah, and cosmos are great. Um, yeah, and I, I, the thing is with a lot of these annuals, uh, if there is built up residue, um, they may not even reseed. Some of the annuals actually need a little bit of disturbance. So in the partial disturbance of clearing the site, you might even get more cosmos to pop up. But yeah, if, if you're feeling confident about the lack of weeds, go ahead and you could see this fall if you removed that residue. 
Um, and then the other thing is you can do follow up with it where if it were a smaller area, um, you know, you could either like weed whack instead of high mowing, you could use an actual larger mower or you could actually begin hand weeding. Um, in larger sites, hand weeding just isn't possible, which is why I talked about those other methods. But at home, if it's a small garden and you have tenacity, get after it. I'm curious what you recommend about um, the moisture of the soil before you seed. Yeah, so I did mention it briefly and kind of forgot to go into it a little bit more in detail. Um, so when we're thinking about when to seed, we ideally in the Northeast, uh, we want to seed in the fall. And part of that is because of most of these seeds, they want a, um, not only do they want that seed to soil contact, but they want the, um, the freezing and thawing. And so that's able to work them into the soil. And so that's why we do it in the fall and that's why we um, compact it. But if in the fall, the, the soil is moist, when we go to compact that field, whether it's with a roller or you literally could do it with all of your volunteers and have them step on every single part of the field, which is possible. I just watched a really cute video of my Xerxes <laughs> colleagues doing that. Um, but yeah, it um, basically whatever equipment you're going to use to roll and compact that site, it that that tiny seed could stick to that equipment if it's mm -hmm. wet or moist. And so that's why we want it to be relatively dry when we seed, because you're going to want to roll that day and we want it to be relatively free of wind because we don't want the seed to go flying. Um, so that's why I, I feel like it's really rare for a site to be more wet in the fall than wetter in the spring, at least mm -hmm. in the Northeast from what I've experienced, there may be some anomalies, um, but if in doubt, you really want to go in the fall, it seems to just overall come out better because there's a lot of just like weird scraggly growth from the spring and a lot of weed pressure if you do it like that. The benefit if you did have the extra funds to transplant um, seedlings is that you could actually do that in the spring. And mm. if you're, you know, if funding wasn't an issue and you really wanted to do it in the spring and you were ready, um, you could do those, you know, plants in the spring and it would work out a lot better than direct seeding. And are all cultipackers um, the same? Or is there some with like grippies or lines? I thought I saw the smooth one. What right. So so what you're talking about is a cultipacker, which can be used for, I, I, you know, it's seeding equipment and it can be used for compacting it, which has all those tiny little uh, kind of textured areas that you mm -hmm. would see in the soil. And then what you saw in this presentation was more of just a lawn roller that you okay. would use for, yeah, it is just smooth. Hmm. Um, so you could use either one if you had the ability to rent a cultipacker. Yeah, perfect. That's the perfect. Um, yeah, I think it's called a brilliant cedar um, hmm. cultipacker. Then yes, you could use that. Um, but really, anything within reason uh, to compact it in there, even if you just had you know, a classic hoe and just went down and yeah. pressed it with that, or like I said, even your feet, as long as you truly accurately press every area. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for all those interesting questions that are actually gonna be put to use with on the ground conservation. Exactly. It's like all these questions are like, what should we be we be preparing for for the, in the next two weeks? 
Um, <laughs> so getting a cult packer or a lawn roller is definitely on my my list of things to do this week. Yeah, and then also purchasing some sort of bulking agent. Mm. So that could be play sand, it could be gypsum. Some people even use kitty litter. Um, it could just any or cornmeal or that's so I don't weird. know, <laughs> but anything that you feel comfortable with putting it on. Diane, I think we we might should go with sand. We but, used sand last time. But... We're gonna need a lot of sand for a half acre, yeah. aren't we? I I wouldn't go. I wouldn't purchase that much. I would just yeah. because I mean, have you? Do you already have your seed? Yeah, the seeds. Are, it's like in a box. They came in a box like this big. It wasn't even that much. Right. So, you know, I wouldn't go too overboard. Um, maybe double the volume of your seed. So. If your seed is this big, maybe split it into four different buckets um, based on, I don't know if your seed is already mixed together or if they're separate. Some um, are, some aren't. Yeah, so kind of just do them by, if possible, kind of put the large seeds together and put the smaller seeds together and put the fluffy seeds together. Mm. And then um, you could add a bulking agent into some of those, or you could even within the large seeds, we're going to do those first. We're going to divide them into the four buckets and mm -hmm. mix them in. I'm going to do that first. Okay, now we're going to do our fluffy seeds. Mm -hmm. We're going to, I don't know. Actually, with the fluffy seeds, it might not make sense to mix in with the carrying agent because you might mm -hmm. actually see them with the fluffiness. Um, but yeah, I would, I would do it in portions because it's, yeah, it's easy to... Oh, whoops, I <laughs> ran out of seed and I didn't cover all of the area. <laughs> that sounds like the trickiest part, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's but if you if even... you divide, you know, if you your your field is already kind of roughly divided into four. So if you kind of mm -hmm. do it in quadrants, just do one first and see if it worked pretty well. And if it does, do those same methods or tweak it in the process. So I noticed that you had that your um, colleague had like four different buckets. Mm -hmm. And so do you recommend putting those different types of seeds into a different bucket with the mixing agent or try to get them all mixed together? I would do it by seed type at a time. Um, okay. So like you saw those the cup plant seeds were kind of like a larger, almost closer to a sunflower seed size. Um, you would put other like sized ones together. Um, and then, yeah, I think if I were you, I would, for instance, start with your big seed, start with one quadrant of your field with that big seed, divide it into four buckets or however many you have however many buckets you have. Um, then even within that quadrant, you could divide that quadrant into four areas to just extra make sure you're um, laying it down, broadcasting it in an even way. Mm. And then mix in um, just those big seeds in the four different buckets with that carrying agent and then, or the bulking agent, and then um, now with those same four buckets that are empty because they've been seeded, now we're gonna put in our smaller seed or medium-sized seed, whatever makes sense with the situation that you have, and then seed that down into that same exact quadrant. And then next go through with your fluffy grass seed. And now you've completed your one-fourth of your field now, you know, and if you feel comfortable with those methods and you felt like, oh, I got an even distribution, you could do that again on another quadrant or tweak it so that you're more successful on your next, next quadrant. Oh, that's great advice. That I appreciate hearing that. Thank you. Yeah. It's yeah. really good advice. Yeah, what are you doing October 15th? Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like I should be hanging out with you. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and that, that's an open invitation to all the diehards that are still hanging on with us, um, listening to these awesome uh, Q&As. Um, if you are interested in all seriousness to, to join us on October 15th at the McLean Center in Concord, we'll be doing all of this, this type of work, moving those tarps from the year one plots to the year two plots, and then um, seeding those, those first year plots. So just get in contact with uh, me or Diane if you're interested in, in joining us. Cool. Do you want to do you want to stick our emails in the chat there? Oh yeah. Anybody yeah, yeah. Who might be interested? Yeah, seating party. Yeah, no, this was some really great advice because that's that's not something that a lot of us have done before. So it's really good to hear how we might proceed to make it as effective as possible. Yeah, it all makes sense until you actually go to do it. You're like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how was that? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, now you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing now. You have a good plan. But um, yeah. Oh, you're uh, we, welcome, Vicki. <laughs> yeah, we should think... just... Sorry, go ahead, Mark. I was going to close it out, so go ahead. What, what are you going to say, Diane? I, I just wanted to share that um, after we've finished this process, we are actually going to have a workshop that goes over some of the techniques. Alina is going to be part of that workshop, and that's going to be on November 4th. So we'll be sharing that out soon. So if any of you are interested in seeing more details and learning more information specific to creating pollinator meadows. Um, we'd love you to join us then. Yeah, learn from our successes and our failures. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for your interest in the Exploring Connections series, uh, hosted by us, New Hampshire Audubon, and supported by the New Hampshire Humanities Council. Um, you saw in the chat, and I'll be sending it uh, in an email, the evaluation survey for this webinar. Um, your re feedback is super important to us as we continue to host these types of talks, talks and it's really helpful in reporting back to our funder. The, so thanks in advance for filling that out for us. The next talk in the series will take place just next week on October 5th, featuring our own Dr. Pamela Hunt on the state of New Hampshire birds. And um, this series will continue every week, week or so throughout the fall. So please visit our website for, to register for that talk and the rest of the update talks. Thank you, Alina, for presenting this evening. Thank, thank you, Diane, you. Thank for you, organizing Alina. this series. And thank you all for tuning in uh, this evening to learn alongside us. We look forward to seeing you at the next webinar in the near future. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, Alina. Really appreciate you. you being with us. Take care, everyone. Yeah, have a great night. Take care.